you guys don't need introductions, right? You all know who they are. That's why you're here. So they're both great. Um, and I put together, based on what we talked about, the three of us, what I have now been calling the five Ps all day in my head. It's pretty proud of myself. Um, they are pattern, planning, process, portraiture slash painting, and politics. So that's like a very loose structure. Y'all, that was from you guys. I just sort of synthesized. Um, so that's like to give you a very loose structure, very, very loose about what we're going to talk about. Um, so I think the first thing that I maybe wanted to ask you both to do very briefly is to just tell us about the shows that are up right now um, in a kind of as succinct a manner as possible so that we can get going to unpacking them. But just in case people haven't seen the work, it's obviously up here behind you, but just kind of the cohesive narrative about what you were thinking for these shows. Yeah, okay. Uh, hi, my name is Odilia Odita. Um, I have um, at my show's at the 24th Street space. Um, in the show itself, I was uh, pushing forward with uh, the paintings themselves. Uh, in my 2013 show in um, the Jack Shaman Gallery, um, This, That, and the Other. And then the show I did in 2014 at uh, the Stevenson Gallery in Cape Town. I was dealing with the pattern and trying to really construct space through pattern, being very, very uh, adamant about trying to expand upon and, 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 and break space open through pattern. There were certain things that um, I wasn't satisfied with uh, in those experiments and in that study of work. <coughs> and uh, I pushed him to this other place with this, uh, current, with this, with this current show. Uh, it's opened up quite a lot of things for me, uh, and um, I'm going to continue to explore that uh, within the paintings themselves. Um, and, the, and that's the canvas paintings I'm speaking of. With the wood panel paintings, it was an extension of something I did in 2013 in Orlando at the George C. Young Federal uh, Building and Courthouse, where we did an install on wood panels within the main lobby. There was really pretty fascinating thing that happened uh, uh, visually, uh, the phenomena of the paintings floating in the space. It seemed that they projected right off, they came right off the wood and floating in the space. So that's something I wanted to explore more with the wood panel paintings. And both sets of paintings, including the wall work, there's a narrative that um, uh, I've always had a sense of in the work, but I'm trying to push that further uh, you know, with what I'm doing, this sense of storytelling and not storytelling like a story A, B, C, B, but storytelling in the way that one experiences the color, the material, and the work within a space. Okay. Thank you. All right, and you? The ratchet again. <laughs> uh, of context and without. <laughs> right? Um, of context and without came, I feel like this is, you know, since this is my fourth show with Jack, um, this is sort of like the the end game, really, of ideas that I've been formulating for the last five years. Um, I think early on when I started showing, I was still trying to figure out my style. I was trying to figure out the language and what the language meant to me. Um, and with of context and without, the irony was that the language became much more prevalent because I removed color. So for me, this became much more apparent that what I'm attracted to in my work is, is the marks themselves, not so much uh, color. I often found that color was distracting, and color can connote a lot of things um, once you apply it. And, and my issue I always had with the reads of my work in the past was that the de facto read was, this is about a Nigerian experience, or this is about something very specific basically, uh, that I didn't feel that was the case when I was making it. And so for me, I, I look at my work now as like this more, much more nebulous space. And it really is about perception and this, you know, prescribed meanings that people have when they look at a figure or they look at a portrait. And I, and I, I know I've talked to you before about this, Ruben. I look at the portrait as an occasion for marks to happen. I'm not thinking about the sitter. I'm not thinking about myself as an artist. I'm really thinking about 
here's a tool that I have, be it charcoal or pen and ink or pencil or what have you. And with that tool, I can create different marks each time, like handwriting. And what the different sort of um, results that happen from me working with this tool. I mean, I'm still doing the same style, but mm -hmm. it changes according to the tool at hand. And that, to me, is much more interesting. So for me, I guess, of context, of context and without is about materials guiding me through the process mm -hmm. um, and exposing that method to people, you know, with the sketches and some of the pieces. So people can really <laughs> see how the thought process works. Mm -hmm. So it's not me trying to talk about a specific subject or specific type of group of people, really. I mean, there are larger things going on, but for me, it's, it's about this is how this tool is guiding me through <laughs> making this work. And that's something that I, I feel I've always been interested in, but I've never really explored in my work before. OK, great. Thank you, guys. Um, so one of the things that you both kind of, it's interesting because you talked about color, and you immediately then talked about removing color, which is kind of quite interesting. So I want to talk about that, but I also, Pattern obviously comes up very obviously in your work, Odili, um, and I think perhaps in less kind of immediately obvious ways in yours, Twain, but I'd like to just hear a little bit from both of you about how you kind of utilize pattern, how you think about pattern, and what per what function either kind of structured and kind of rhythmic pattern versus kind of non-rhythmic, kind of non-static pattern plays in your work. Yeah, um. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, you know, pattern for me is, is many different things actually, but it's like I could talk about it in so many different ways. And right now, what I'm thinking about is, on one hand, how it, it exists as a measure, or you, it exists as a measure. You can use it to, you can, you can add, to, you can have, you can set a pattern, set a, a pattern of structure, set a structure, and then add on to it, add on to it, add on to it, add on, add on to it to make a space. But then you're dealing with something already preconceived or already understood and ultimately deadly in its boringness, let's say, right? So then it's sort of like, what can you do to make a space, a pattern space, interesting, mm -hmm. something that reflects upon the way that you are thinking about a space in general or wanting to engage a space. How might you want to open that up to become more inclusive of oneself and other things within that space or other people within that space? How might I turn that space against the constructions in the world that want to make us like machines, regular, so that they know what we do day in and day out. Yeah. So this is where I've started to like, think about pattern, and how I can play with its potentiality, rather than something that I know what it is before it ends. So kind of a strategy versus something that's predetermined. Yeah, it's, 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 it's drawing. It's, it's drawing. It's drawing, well. Tell us, drawer. It's <laughs> all I got. Um, no, I, <laughs> That's a lot. It's a lot, yeah. That's a lot. Uh, uh, I think for me, pattern is a. Uh, I mean, I look at, you know, I guess the access point for me is skin. So I'm, I'm thinking of pattern as more of a puzzle for me to figure out. You know, each, you know, the skin for me is the platform. And so I build upon that platform with marks. And so when I'm looking at a figure, even when I look at people's faces, I see the creases, I see the lines. Um, and I, I'm, I'm more interested in how, what composes a face, what composes a figure, and what composes an image, really, in a more macrocosmic way. Structurally. Exactly. And so that's kind of how I build upon things. I mean, pattern is very fascinating to me, but also texture more than anything. I like varying textures and how they activate one another. And uh, I mean, what attracted me to art was seeing how I could really, or how an artist really can push the, the narrative of a work through pattern, through texture, mm -hmm. and how I could, you know, as a viewer, maneuver through that and see different formations and see different ways of, of looking at an image, really. I mean, that's the exciting thing about image making is that you can really create entire worlds through this illusion. You know, yeah. be it through Odili's work with the, with the different systemic 
kind of like breakdowns of color and how they're activating one another. And with mine, it's just different marks. And so uh, pattern is, is, is really just, a, to me, an exciting and true way for people. Mm -hmm. Which kind of also brings me to thinking about kind of process and planning, something that you guys both talked about. Um, and the way, kind of the way that you make your work, the process through which, by which we end at these finished objects, um, being kind of something that's quite methodical, um, that you do think ahead, you do have a, obviously a whole kind of back backstory of you know, what we see before that we don't see. Although in this case, Dwayne, I feel like you are kind of revealing some of your your backstory for us on the show that's downstairs, but um, I'd love for you both to talk a little bit about, if it's not like giving away your secret sauce or something, um, some of the kind of the planning and the methodical nature that as self-described, or if you disagree with that, feel free, but just that goes into what we see when we go into the gallery and the way and why that planning is, is important to you and how it works for you. I, I th for me, it's, it's um it's pretty, the planning is pretty extensive, and um, it's, it's, it goes pretty deep. When I look at it, it's like, uh, it's normal to me, and that's what I'm talking about, my drawings, my books of drawings that I make in the studio, um, the, 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 the color chips I've saved since 1998, for example, of all the paintings I've made, um, you know, the filing and all that stuff that I do, putting stuff like the tubs of paints and everything I have. It's, it's, it's just to know where everything is mm -hmm. and just to know how I can access that information again if I ever need it. But what it comes down to is when I'm making it, it's like intuition. Mm -hmm. um, I could see somebody's scarf that I saw walking around the corner. Um, it could be the, the memory of a, of a space I was in on a trip last week or five years ago and what the light was as the, the sun set things like this. Mm -hmm. And so it's that kind of thing where I've tried to set up a situation where I can play. I need the grounds, in my process, I need the grounds steady enough so I'm free to just play. Mm -hmm. And play becomes where I'm setting myself up, thinking I'm gonna get a blue, and that blue becomes purple. Mm -hmm. And I didn't expect it to be that, but that's where I wanna take myself to. And so that's where the intuitive and, 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 and all that comes into my creative process. And just quickly, Dwayne, before you oh, all right, before you go, um, I'm just very taken by this image of a book of all of your paint swatches from all the paintings that you've made. Um, I'm curious about: do you are they just reference points for you from past work that you made, or do you reuse different colors in the future? Do you have like a is there a recipe for the colors, if you will? Like especially if it is kind of as esoteric and as specific as something like a sunset on a particular day or somebody's scarf on a particular day, that's not necessarily like Pantone 450. Unless right, it is, right, I don't right. know. Right, no, um, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's open. I mean, it's sort of like I have the chips in case I get painting gets, for it's functionally, if a painting gets damaged, I have the chip to repair the painting. Okay, but, good call. <laughs> but I will never be able to make that color. Oh. I've been, I've had a situation where paint had a, painting had a scratch like that took me four hours to fix it because I had to find that color. It was moving all over the place, going from whatever to whatever to whatever to whatever. That's one thing. Another thing is when I'm in my studio working and I have the colors and I'm done with the show, like this show that was up, I brought all the tubs of paint just in case there was some damage to anything. Then I bring them back to my studio. Now they're waiting for me and my assistants to collapse all the colors. That means we're gonna take everything that's blue-like and put it into one tub. Everything that's red like and put it all into one tub. And then restart again with a whole another body of colors. So it's like a culture. It, uh -huh. like, it becomes like a culture for the future yeah. painting, paint colors. Yeah, I mean, in, in so many ways like that. And in other ways, it's just, I sometimes I like to have the colors sit around and then when I make a little painting, I want to just deal with given colors. I want to just like pick the colors out of the two tubs and just like, I want that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. <laughs> and just to see what new thing and what new situation I can make out of the mix. Interesting. All right, um, Toyin, can you talk a little bit about your? Not on that level, Jesus. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. Your process and your planning. Can you tell us? Of course. 
I'll be praying to every God. Yeah. I know. I mean, we, we all have seen the work that you make down here, so we know that you have an attention to detail. It is. Yes. And it's you know, a dura is durational it. practice say this, on some level. Well, I, speaking of method, I mean, I do get a bit wary of, especially when you're working in representational work, people think, oh, it must be so, like, by default. Like, so easy, like it just falls in. It's like, so. I mean, you know, like it is a plan. I don't think anybody. Um, I mean, the marks <laughs> are complex enough as it is, and like you have to have an outline. You have to have something. To, I love how you said it, Adelia, where you said that you need something that's super structured so you can play, mm -hmm. and that's really what I'm revealing with this show. It's like how I think, how I demarcate, and make sure that that's settled before I can really go ham. Um, but I mean. I'm not as confident with color as Odelia is. I and mean, even when I do some of the you know, the pieces that are much more colorful in my work, it's there is a lot of planning that I have to I don't have a paint to but, you see, you see, but I have but, markers. But you see, and they're very, very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> they're all set out on the table. But right? the, you know? the, the confidence thing with the color, it's sort of like sometimes you know, I want to get to a place sometimes where I make a paint. I'm like, what the heck? You know, like, I'm looking at it. Oh, we can say fuck. <laughs> it's going to be. Now we can. Yeah. <laughs> but basically. Oh, it's live stream, isn't it? <laughs> but basically, you know, it's 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 a, it's a place of strangeness in a way that you know, I want to be in a place where it's unfamiliar to me because that's when I'm going to get something new out of it. Mm -hmm. And I think, like, when I look at, there's a photograph of Natoyan's out right up. Photograph. <laughs> right? There's a there's a drawing out there um, that she did with lithography, crayon, crayon. and um, it was it's fascinating to look at. It. I was staring at it while I was in the in, in the space, just staring at it because I was like, it was on this it's on this mantle. It's not on the wall. It's on this mantle piece, this wood piece, and it, it, then it sits there like a picture, you know, like a picture in a house, mm -hmm. a photograph, and then you look at it, and there's a the, the materiality and, and, and the texture you put include with the, that soft pencil behind as a shadow. Yeah. It's like it's like a photograph, and I'm like, this is this is so amazing. This is like this is a drawing, but it's like a photograph. It's sitting on this thing, mm -hmm. and the objectness, the, its meaning is changing because of the way it sits against the wall mm -hmm. on that wood, and then it looks like a photograph. So then it's like, what's this space where you're Texture, your pattern that's making skin is becoming like a person that's real in the space. Like, that's something that's like it's. And it's something that's beyond it's, kind of like yeah. a very realistic. Way it's doing drawing. something else. It's not necessarily about the, re the quote unquote yeah. realism of your drawing. I mean, there's a part of me that's very interested in otherness in my work. I find otherness a very welcoming thing. There's a lot of freedom in otherness. But I also, I think the reason why my work has that quality is because when you're a draftsman and you study under the traditional, you know, European Western tradition that I had um, in school, there was always this like need to go above and beyond to get to the realm of painting because painting is like the highest form, painting and sculpture. And whenever I would like exhibit my work for a critique, they were like, oh, it's just a cute little drawing. I'll say, what? <laughs> no. And so I would always pack in the marks as much as possible because I wanted to prove, it's like a chip on your shoulder, right? I want to prove that drawing is equally, in fact, sometimes a little better than painting. Um, and, but it will always be regarded because it's works on paper. Okay? That's it's always regarded as inferior. And that was something I was, I wanted the, to push against, right? That's the language thing we were talking about earlier. Like exactly. The, the, the prejudice that comes into the against prejudice. forms. Yes. <laughs> against things. Tell it, Odile. Come on, let's go there. Yeah, but I mean, it's. I was waiting for this moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it is, like, that was one thing. <laughs> it was like, God. Um, but there was one thing that I, I always was fighting against in my education was that, you know, there's so many levels already that we have to come up against. But mm -hmm. even in the actual work that I was making, drawing was just seen as something as like an idea starter, a catalyst. Mm -hmm. It's not the pre finished. Preparatory drawing. Exactly. It's not yes. the finished product. Um, and I think that's what I really wanted to do with this show, is that I want to push that idea mm -hmm. to the fore. I want you to see something that is considered unfinished or the beginnings of something and have that be the final product. And how do you read it mm -hmm. as a viewer when you see that and I find it to be a completed thought much more so than it is if it's super layered on my large piece of out there I mean, 
the, the beauty of pattern is that it, you kind of get lost in the mezzanine, right? Mm -hmm. You become, I don't know, it, it, it envelopes your mind. I, I like mezzanine awesome. meaning like the middle ground, or the middle, in between floor. Maybe that's the wrong word. I, I'm thinking words. I mean, that worked for me. Metaphorically. <laughs> I just thought of a big word. <laughs> um, but I'm thinking like, you know, just like, I'm thinking of these like labyrinthine, see, I'm a big word, labyrinthine <laughs> sort of like, you know, more like I can get lost in it. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, it's so weird because even now, I think when people describe my work and they say drawings, they always want to put painting. Mm -hmm. It's so funny. It's like, oh, these paintings. And I'm like, nah, boom, these are drawings. <laughs> but can you talk about your investment in drawing? Um, and at any point in the past, have you been a painter or were you? Oh, no, I was literally told to my face, to my eye sockets, <laughs> that I could not paint and uh, by many professors in the past, and they were very right. Um, I like the, the directness of a, of a pencil or a pen or something mm -hmm. that's finely point, you know, I can really get that tip down. Brush, it just folds. Wrong. How's it folding? No offense, Amelia. <laughs> 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 What's going on? I have you. Other people. No, but it's like I, I like that because for me it's it's uh, I can press as hard as I want. I can you know it's not the same with me as a brush. A brush to me feels precarious. I, I I'm not comfortable with mm -hmm. that tool. Um, I'm much more comfortable with harder tools, I guess. And something more immediate and tactile. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. The immediacy is key. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to think, like, you know, there, some criti criticism that, you'll, that you can say against a painter when they're using the brush is like, oh, um, you're drawing with the paint versus painting with the paint. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, it could be that the work is to be drawn with the paint and then it, becomes, it can become successful. But let's say if the person's trying to actually just paint, paint, paint and then they're using the paintbrush like a, a pencil, mm -hmm. and that's something else. So it's, it's interesting how these, these terms can uh, uh, slip into each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, drawing is, is, is interesting, for, like the show velocity of change. It's, it's a question about drawing and, and, and form in a certain way. Like the term velocity of change is something that it was, when I was at Scott Hegan, uh, this past summer, I was there as a resident faculty there with um, the residents, and there was a, uh, a, a resident, uh, Nick Fagan, we were talking about the fact, he said, there's no line in, in nature. And, uh, <laughs> there's no line in nature. Everything is essentially just uh, form, you know, just form, and that when we use a, a line, an outline or to make a contour, it's the beginning of constructs, and that, in fact, and it was really interesting, and as I said, in fact, you know, we were, we were discussing this back and forth, and this is when I was thinking that it's, the, I'm telling my students, you know, this idea of drawing something, when you take the information that you see from your eyes, put it on paper, we're beginning, the, we're beginning to identify things in this nature of language and constructs, using a line to create a, bring a form out of space. And, but the fact is that we're saying everything is shadow and light. You know, it's just the, velo the different degrees of shadows are the velocity of light in space. So this is like the velocity of change is really just about this idea of, in a bigger meta sense, like no line. Maybe we don't need to be in this world where we have these constructs that inadvertently come against us, but we can just see forms and engage forms. You know? But I've always been into like this, um, and the way I talk now helps me when I teach you, of course. But it's like I've always been interested in thinking about things. Right? It's like as a kid growing up as a Nigerian kid in the suburbs in Ohio, it was really boring and terrible. And I was like, Imagine being a Nigerian in Alabama. Right. Um, <laughs> so I got Columbus you. was Columbus was something else though. But it was like I was like, you know, why am I here? Simply like, why why am I here? It's so you know? interesting though. And what did you come up with? <laughs> I mean, you're here now, so you think I'm We escaped. Yeah. But yeah, that's really, that's a great point. I mean, maybe that is, the line is the, a man-made, like, need mm -hmm. to understand the world. Man-made. Human-made. Person-made. Or person-made. <laughs> world that, you know, it's the way to combat nature, to control it, right? To say that I command nature when, in fact, let's be real, there's a blizzard coming tomorrow. We do not <laughs> nature at all. And 
that's so fascinating that you would think of it that way because you don't, I mean, I'm always thinking about constructs, honestly. Mm -hmm. And I do realize that even when I make that mark, even though I'm trying to do usurp a construct, I am also, in a way, creating another construct. Um, and, and what responsibility do I have in that new construct that I'm forming? Yeah. Um, I always think that I'm going against something. I never think about what comes after I go against that. Um, but I don't know, like, I mean, even then, like, you know, where, why am I here? That whole thing, I mean, that was a constant, that's what led me to this style in general. I mean, mm -hmm. I want to go into the biographies. I know we talked about this really, but yep. when I remember when I first moved to Alabama, I often said I became a black person, and that was real. That was like there. And I <laughs> never forget being nine and having some, you know, other black kids come up to me and be like, yo, Africa. And I'd be like, whatever. That's a continent, not a country. Know where you're from. <laughs> and so and then having someone call me, oh, you're really dark or you're really black, and I'm like, actually I'm a bit of a mahogany, maybe a little bit of black. Senior yeah, but you know, it was like the tonalities, right? And and that was what started this thing. It's like the constructs are, you know, that idea, even at nine, I was like, this doesn't make sense. And the questioning of what makes up an identity, what makes up a person is multifaceted. It changes from context to context. I mean, we all have those codes. When you're on the phone, you have a different voice than you would when you were with your friends, especially if you're trying to get a job. So um, there's different, you know, you become different. Y'all are laughing, but you know it's true. Um, there's different uh, identities that we take on. There's different, you know, and it's not even that, but I think there's this need, I don't know, maybe particularly in American society more than anything, to put up a very, well, maybe this idea of authenticity, but put up a very finite and specific type of identity that is, is really exhausting. I think. Well, it's like, you know, again, it's, for me, it's like, it's all about the fictions of authenticity. I mean, mm. I'm really into, into, into that, mm -hmm. to thinking about how the, 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 we, we, we create uh, these, um, uh, these notions, these, we create these, um, you know, we create these identities for its given and specific purposes, mm -hmm. whatever they might be, and ultimately it's about power in mm -hmm. one way, one form or another, mm -hmm. but it's power over environment, power over another person, power over another culture. <coughs> But these, these constructions power over ourselves, you know. You know? But it's, it's interesting to think about the, the, them, this idea as, as, as a fiction. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, and also I think something both of you brought up, which I think is obvious to many people, but it depends on where you're kind of positioned on this spectrum, but that, you know, materials are culturally specific, culturally grounded, the way we see, the way we think, the way we perceive, the way we interpret is culturally grooved, as you said yesterday, Odile, which I thought was a really great expression. And so it's, and it's not so much, it's just to be the awareness of that specificity, that my perception is not the same as your perception. It doesn't mean that either of them are right or wrong or better or worse, but just that you not liking it might have nothing to do with what it is. It might be about you and not in a mean way, just like it might be about you and where you're coming from with it. Um, so I think that one thing that you both talked about, which is very much connected to all this, is this idea of agency um, and of kind of the creation of agency, politics, political agency, et cetera, um, both of which, Odile, you said we work out of agency, which is also a really, you had a lot of nice terms of phrase in our conference call. Um, but I'd love for you guys to both talk a little bit about that. So what, where is political agency in your work? What is your interpretation of the political agency, either that's embedded in your work, or that you could bring to the work, or that others perhaps may take away from the work? I think there was like a question I got um, <coughs> in an interview once where someone was like, do you think your work is political? And I was like, heck yeah. I mean, the the moment that I decide as who I, you know, what I am really in this social political landscape we live in, to make a mark and to claim that mark, mm -hmm. that's very political mm -hmm. from the get. Um, and so that to me, coming from the sort of how I grew up and, and how I decided to be an artist or whatever, um, I never thought that was really something I could 
could be or I could claim for a very long time. I mean, I most of my references to image making was through a European Western tradition um, that was a very confident, very masculine tradition, and I felt like, what can I bring to this? And if I bring anything to it, will I be able to claim it as my own, or will it be taken up by someone else and become some other fiction that is, you know, beyond my control? And the power I feel now more than ever is that no one else can take this work from me. You know, I mean, you can try to copy it, and Godspeed. Um, <laughs> But it's, uh, it's like once that is out there and it's in the public domain, I claim it. And that's, a, that's like I always often say land. That's a space for me mm -hmm. to roam. That's a space for me to exist. Even if I'm not there, I'm, I'm there, you know. And, and my ideas, my, I guess my histories, you know, that is, is always going to be in that work. And I think we talked about this yesterday at the conference call. We, we have the history, we have the education, but we lack the history, which is something that I really have a lot of issues with because how infuriating is it that you have so much information and you're pulling from a well of so many tools and ideas, but yet you don't have the resources to, to claim something historically um, because there's no record. And we've been there. Oh, we've been there. It's just no one wrote it down. I remember when I was in Christmas, I was talking to my dad, and he was telling me all the stories of my grandfather, my great-grandfather. I was like, oh, what year was this? Was this 1930? And he's like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And that was like mind-boggling to me. I'm like, how could you not know this was 19? I mean, doesn't anyone write it down? And he's like, well, they were in the village. They were in the village. It was all in the head. They just remembered, because it was oral tradition. and like. That, well, even, I mean, even your expectation on some level or your desire for it to write right. down is actually, it's, it's a very, what I was saying. So right. It's like you are now kind of in this culture. It's a very colonized culture. thought. No, it's, it's, well, it's the claim that it's, I mean, it's modern, facts. it's contemporary, it's 21st <laughs> century. Like, I mean, there are many ways we can think about it, but I think it's important to be self reflexive about because there's nothing wrong with an oral tradition. There's nothing inherently yeah, flawed about a system in which things are remembered, mm. in which things are passed orally, which things are not written down. Mm. That system works. Absolutely. Until it, you know. Right, but then there's that. And so I think even well. to, even to, the desire for it to be written down or for it to be codified is to capture it on some level for, and I feel the same impulse about my own family. Like, I want to know when it happened. Who is there a picture of that person? Like, mm -hmm. the kind of tangibles. But I also, again, it's about me. It's not about anything being lacking mm -hmm. in that system right. that existed. It's also about what happened subsequently, which made it necessary, feel mm -hmm. necessary, to write things down and to kind of fix things. And also this idea of legitimacy, yeah. which is so, like, it's like, ugh. Because you know it's there. You know it's real. But you need to prove it, you know? Mm -hmm. And not just for yourself, but just to say, like, this happened now. You can't take this away, mm -hmm. you know? And that, that's, that's very complicated. I mean, it's very, like, in a, in a very interesting way. I mean, it's like, you're in a situation where you're, what you're describing is in a situation where you know you exist, you know you, you are here, you have a history, but your history is not important to most people in the world or most people in, in a society. Then you're like, okay, why, what, what is this about? My history is not important. You know, and then it makes you mad because it's like, I have to explain, my, like I have to like over explain myself just to even be heard. Or you literally are an intelligent individual saying, my history is just not important, period. And it's like, what then is the world? What, what world is being created with that kind of sentiment? You know, I think that, uh, you know, being existing does not make you political. Mm -hmm. Being a man or woman, white or black, does not make you political. It's what you do. Because it's like I could be uh, I, could, I could be a white man with a racist dad and a racist mom, and then I say to my racist mom and dad, "F you," and I'm going to do this and that. I'm going to march here. I'm going to go against this. I'm going to I I'm going to I'm going to uh, live with live here. I'm going to think this way. I'm going to get this job. You know. So it's it's the and, and vice versa. So I think it's a matter of just realizing, for me, when I'm making my work, knowing that the work has an intention, intentionality, 
and it's coming into a, a, a space of being that asks these questions, that begs these questions, I think then that is a, a pathway to the political. I hate the art world where one has to prove themselves. Mm -hmm. Is your work political enough? Mm -hmm. How are you being political? Mm -hmm. This then gets into the, the, the language construct, which yeah. is like, Intelligent people being stupid. But I think I, I remember reading a, a quote, I think it was actually an artist who, whose who title of work it says, Is Visibility Enough? Which I thought was really powerful because there's always this need to just, because you know, we slip into tokenism a lot and like being what we are in the art world, there is that moment where you're like, okay, am I just that one in the room? <laughs> and uh, and then there's also that moment too where you're like, well, it's there, you know, this this is, you know, the piece is there, this person is there, but are they doing anything? Are they given any are given any words to speak, or are they speaking from their own, you know, point of view and their own? And that's you know, a dangerous position too. I remember reading a long time ago Jacob Lawrence. His wife, in fact, was uh, giving a lecture. Ed Bradley was interviewing her, and it was in, in Atlanta when, when he was alive. And she said that Jacob Lawrence, Jake, her husband, had really a hard time being the only one in the room. And you know, you have, when you think about it, you're like, you know, you have to, you have this weight of of of, the, of this other force, this other reality on you. You 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 are by yourself with your beliefs and your strength, and you realize in a certain way it's like being alone in a river, and alone in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a massively rolling river. You know, how do you, how can you help change a tide by yourself? So like this tokenism thing is really an important issue to think about because we have to realize it's not about like flavor of the month, and it's great that it's in this magazine this month. It's like people have to get on board to, Make a change, and not change for one group of people. It's change, mm -hmm. right? You know? Well, and expansion of, in all kind of senses of the word. Yeah. I mean, I think something that I think about um, a lot with your work, Odelia, is this idea. Like, you know, we have this idea of if you studied art history, which I mean, we all, we at least we three did, but I have a feeling a lot of you guys did. Um, and you kind of learn about the kind of abstract expressionists. You learn about like you know, hardline painting, you can learn about color field painting, and there's this idea of kind of pure abstraction, um, which is a total construct, it's a total fallacy, like everybody is speaking from a space of specificity, that's just, we're human beings, that's what we do, like we think about things in our heads, that's why we do it, we're not like operating on some plane where we're just pure abstraction. Um, but I think the only people that and that's speaking in very broad swaths, but the only people that for a long time were attended to that were people who were forced to be attended to that because you can't be engaging in pure abstraction, Odili, because, duh. Mm -hmm. But I'm just curious, I mean, and I don't think that you... And by that, she made you black. Yeah, yeah exactly. I'm just, just saying. And, you know, because you're using bright colors and because I want to say, like, oh, African textiles, and how, you know, because I want to go down that road, which you can go down, but there's, like, the point is, it's not that that road is inaccurate, but there's like 50 roads we could go down. You know, we could go down your, your book of paint, paint chips road, which is, I think, a really interesting road. But um, I just, I'm interested to hear you specifically talk about your relationship to abstraction um, in the context of this question of everybody being in a cultural brew of their own. Yeah, and, I mean, and moving and making choices to be representational, to be abstract, to work with paint, to work with drawing, to, you know, this is all coming out of a personal specific space, whether you're Jackson Pollock or, you know, anybody else at that moment, mm -hmm. Mark Rothko, mm -hmm. you, Jacob Lawrence, you know, Alma Thomas, we could go on. Yeah, well, for me, it's like, it's not about authenticity, it's about experience. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, uh, you can define yourself authentically whatever trope is that you, you give yourself or the society might give you to help easily engage that, that idea. But um, I think it's really experiential. What you go through in your life, everybody has a different kind of experience. We all might have uh, the same texture hair or even skin what, and whatnot, anything like that. We might even come from the same town, but we all have a different uh, experience coming from that place we've come from. So I think it's sort of like, uh, uh, for me, it's, it's about experience and, and engaging that truth first. Um, I, uh, 
with abstraction for me it was the hardest thing to even accept the term terminology mm -hmm. um, I didn't know what I didn't believe in abstraction even as being called an abstract painter. Well, because, because also this is abstraction too. Yeah, you know, exactly. Like, I mean, a representational drawing is itself an abstraction. This is abstraction in a certain way. I mean, it's writing, certain, is you know, <laughs> writing is abstraction. <laughs> like, speak, I mean, true. I would look at a blank canvas and see a horizontal line in the middle of the blank canvas and think, oh, it's a horizon line. And somebody would say, no, it's, it's a line. Or somebody would say, no, it's two planes meeting each other. <laughs> I'm just like, OK, well, we're using like, we're, we're talking about what this thing is. Mm -hmm. And we're bringing ourselves to associations of what this thing might be. So I'm like, OK, what's abstraction? We're, up, we're having this conversation about all these different things. You know, we're talking about all this stuff. But for or me, what's not abstraction. Right, right, <laughs> right, right. Well, for me, it's like, I, what's interesting about abstraction Primarily, though, is this the, the kind of critical and intellectual investigation of artists involved in this the, in the paradigm? Mm -hmm. The idea of pushing vision and visuality in a way as to like go beyond what we can, what we have realized, what we can, uh, what we have seen uh, now, mm -hmm. making something potentially possible in the ways that we can see the world new or fresh in the future. That's interesting to me when yeah. I think about the abstract project. Other than that, I'm still like, you know, that, horse, that, <laughs> that line is a horizon, you know. Slash, slash, <laughs> slash. Yeah. Um, and can you talk a little bit now, that actually I'm just reminded seeing this really amazing mural that you just did. Can you talk, um, and both of you I'm interested in this because you do both operate on different scales, although Odile, obviously <coughs> yours <laughs> are even larger, the size of buildings, etc. But can you talk about the experience um, and the choices that you make around when you work very, very large like this, and like the piece that you did at recently at the Nasher versus, you know, a piece on canvas, etc. And kind of how your eye shifts or the work shifts when you like this yeah. amazing. Yeah, I mean, amazing. they're they're all different scales. I mean, the the thing of the thing about doing this work is it reminds me again of how it always it comes back to painting. And it reminds me of how intense painting is, just, just painting on the canvas, let's say. Um, that in a lot of cases, we forget how to look at a painting when we have a painting like this. And the way paintings like this remind us of all the things, of, at least it reminds me of all the things that we engage when we can look at a painting. Like, painting is always experiential. Mm -hmm. It's always space-oriented. Even if it's on a canvas, on a nail, it's about the space it's in. Mm -hmm. It can transform the space in many different ways. And but we take the art world of gallery going and whatnot makes us reduces the way we experience. Is this smart people being stupid again? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. maybe. Yeah, but it's but for me it's it's the, it's all these things. And then I I love this idea of bringing the studio to the public. Mm -hmm. People can watch the work being made. That you can see the work in different ways. You can see it driving past it. You can see why you're eating a bagel. You can see it from a, across the room. Mm -hmm. You can think about it behind you. You know, just it, it, it just functions in these multiple ways that a painting on canvas still does. Mm -hmm. Just so, writ large, literally. Yeah, in the space, it's, it's in, because it's embedded in the space itself. And have you always kind of had these two, like, very, the very macro scale? Like, have you, like, when did you first do kind of an outdoor or a large scale kind of installation like this? Well, when I was, um, say, I was always interested in Ankuara as a, as a undergraduate mm -hmm. student, and then Felix Gonzalez Torres when I was in grad school. Mm -hmm. But um, on Kawara, because I love this idea of making art out of a suitcase that he didn't have a studio, he could travel. Mm -hmm. He was doing those postcards for saying, I'm alive, and then mailing them to people. Mm -hmm. you know? And then later on, his paintings, which he can just paint them, date paintings, but he can still just paint them anyway. Mm -hmm. It's just the day he made them. And so like for me, like when I first did my I, I couldn't think, the, 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 I had a one person show at a place called Gallery 101 in uh, Ottawa, Canada. They couldn't pay for shipping paintings, so I went there. Shipped yourself. I shipped myself. <laughs> and your stuff. I'm going to take it on the plane. <laughs> and uh, I was there, and, and I just bought materials in the, in the city and made the work for the show. Mm -hmm. And then I started just doing shows like that where I'm just making work on site and making paintings on the walls. Mm -hmm. And so with the wall paintings then, I was still thinking of them in a traditional uh, one point perspective manner, just like standing in front of them going, oh, it's a painting, you know, like looking at it like that. Mm -hmm. And not realizing at that time the potentiality of what space does 
and how space engages this. So over time, I, uh, I, I, I learned more about that. And I think the thing I did in, in a, a show I had, my first show at Jack's uh, Fusion, there's a wall painting I had in the back. That was my second show, I believe. But I had a wall painting in the back, and then Rob Store saw it, understood something about it, and he threw me into this big space in Venice. Oh, and uh, and from there, I really was able to just uh, turn it on and 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 uh, really explore painting as pure possibility, because that's what the wall paintings are. They're that's just fine. painting, painting as possibility. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and Twain, so you, I think. You know, intimate scale is something is a word that I would would come to mind um, because maybe more that just there is an intimacy to your work because I think obviously of the subject matter and the way that you really you know depict people. But I am I do feel like in this show you're operating on a lot of different scales, whether that is full body imagery or a kind of tight crop of a face, or whether it's literally like a larger piece of paper versus a smaller piece of paper. So do you? have a sense, just how does scale operate for you? It's interesting because I was just listening to what Odile was just saying. Um, I mean, I was just looking at that building with the, I mean, imagine what if that building didn't even have that. God, that would be that so building was depressing. Mad. You know what I mean? Like, just, I was just thinking about like, that. God, it's so depressing. I mean, imagine, just think about it. If that wasn't there, that would be the most depressing looking That's building. That's how it was before you know? last and, year. <laughs> but and then it just also got me thinking because I love that and and there's work like Odili, excuse me, that operates on that and thank God for that. But mm -hmm. what I love about when I first started showing in um, in a gallery space was not so much about my drawings being in a gallery space, like who came into the gallery space, because it was like who, like what kind of culture is being created by the people who come to see the work. That really is interesting to me. Like the more variety, the better. You know, um, I, I I think that's what really fascinates me too. Is that it gives me a different read each time when I see different people coming in. I've had you know people come up to me and say, I never you know I don't come to galleries normally, but I just wanted to see the show. And I'm like, great, you know, yeah. tell your friends too. And and it became it becomes much more of a culture in, in itself in that way because then the dialogue changes because then it's like it's not just this small pool of people. You know, it expands, and I, I, I kind of work off that mm -hmm. as well. Um, and the intimacy in my work is just I want to give the viewer more. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, look, I'm serious. There are, and ideally, I don't know if you agree with me on this, but you can do a big painting, but really, it's just you couldn't do it smaller. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's just. Can you tell it, how you really think it's it's just, just, <laughs> Um, no, you do it. No, no, I'm not talking about you. No, I mean, but you know what I'm talking right, about. Right. It's like you just see, like, scale. Yeah. yeah. And that's it. For the sake of scale. For the sake Versus of for the sake of Oh, I'm not going to mention. No, no, no. <laughs> but, uh, but yes. Yeah. Free time. <laughs> it was just, it's just like Let's that. Scale, right. Scale. It's and really I, hard. right. And I, and I remember even when I started, you know, the, and still I do very small drawings. I remember someone saying, like, are you ever going to go big? And I said, I mean, this ain't big for you. Because this is a whole universe to me. Because when I'm packing up those scales, scales of perception. Right. Yeah. And like it's that, again, it's about intimacy. I think a lot of people, what is it? They think that the average view of a painting or a drawing or anything that's on a you know, two-dimensional picture plane or whatever, it's like 0.2 seconds or something crazy like that. I mean, I don't, I mean, when I go to a museum or I go to a show, I, I go in. I Thank see the you. details. We appreciate you know? that. <laughs> but I, I, I want to have a moment with it. And this is a great opportunity. You get to see something without a screen in front of you. Mm -hmm. This is a nice moment. And as a painter, it's really hard to make small work. It truly is, I think, to make work that's smaller and has the world in it, like you're talking about, is so difficult. That's why I love Jacob Lawrence, because it's like, this guy, he makes, this, there's smaller paintings with like 20,000 things in them. Mm -hmm. And there's all that space. I'm like, damn. I'm like, <laughs> how, does, how, does, how does he do that? That's incredible. And there's a complexity to it as well, and I think, not to say that works that are a large scale don't have that impact, obviously. There's, there's something in that as well. It's a different type of experience. But let's not discount something simply because it's small. I think yeah. that's, that's really what 
I was pushing at as well when I started. But yeah. I'm working larger now because I wanted to push the marks. I wanted to see how far I could and go. push yourself. Right. I mean, I, I I just you know, in this show I'm much working with a much more monochromatic palette. So for me, it's like how do I push blackness? As mm -hmm. a, as a but what, what I love about your black, whiteness. what I love about your black though in the, in your in your show is the color that comes out of it. Even in this piece that's against this on the other side of this wall, it's a really beautiful piece there. And it's just the way that you, you, you're doing the material. And that's the key thing we talked about the other day. I mean, material is so key in my work and your work. And in any good artist's work, I think it's the way that they deal with the intent of material. And you're, you're, you're bringing color out of that black that's really amazing. Tell it but it's, it's <laughs> but it is. I mean, it's just like well, and then it's the texture of the surface that you're drawing on, as well as the medium, with and the, the paper, paper the charcoal, oh, the yeah. It's, it's funny because, like, you know, speaking of black, I remember reading. I was talking to Joe about this earlier. I was reading an interview with Robert Ryman about whiteness, and he had such interesting things to say about it as a material. He was talking about how it's this like nuanced, you know, sort of like quality to it, and it, it has this ability to highlight, but it also has the ability to cover up things. And, and he said he didn't even look at it as a color, you know, he saw it as something of, of an, another element in the ether. And the um, funny thing was, that what, what really drew me to work with white was because it was actually quite the opposite. I found white to be very exclusive and very suppressive. And dare I say it, oppressive as a material because it was, it, look, I mean, it's popping out at you. It's very contrasting and not just on the, the, the black uh, board. I mean, even when I was working on it with the white, I mean, there was a moment where I was like, this is really harsh, mm -hmm. you know? And the thing that I always thought when I worked with black charcoal is that it was very inclusion, it, it, it included a lot of colors, so it was actually a softening, mm -hmm. you know, it was a matte surface, it wasn't as intense. Um, but the thing that I loved about the whiteness is that it does erase. That is without question. I mean, that's, uh, you know, my brother, but she would never know that, mm -hmm. ever. Um, and that really fascinates me because it suspends identity mm -hmm. um, in a way that was really fascinating to me. And, you know, as a material, you know, and this is some shade because <laughs> when I was working with the black charcoal, it was smooth, it was beautiful, it just glides. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like ice cold. And then, but it gets everywhere. It gets in your hair, it gets in your nails, it gets in your clothes. Once the floor is touched, you can't rub that off. It's there. But the white charcoal? <laughs> Let me tell you something. It was super hard to draw on. I had to press super hard on the surface. I'm like, urgh, get my mark in. But then my floors? Immaculate. <laughs> my floors? Nothing to it. Just wash it off and it's gone. I said, excuse me. Who is making this material? I need to know facts. I need to see the factory. talking about materials, the specific materials kind of dictate Absolutely. your approach and also not only your approach but also what work is made and mm -hmm. so you specifically talked about how working with the white charcoal kind of changed your method Absolutely. and the way you saw things so now we know a little bit about that <laughs> but is this the first time that you had worked like you know you do I think in this show you really showed your your range in some ways <laughs> in terms of materials in terms of surfaces and is this is this the first time that you've worked with this kind of wider range of materials? I think this is the first time I've worked with a wide range of materials and it's all in one show. And it's all in one show. Right, I think I, I've always been playing with graphite and white charcoal, but to have it all on display is really interesting because it, 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 they, there are conversations that are activated. Um, like when I started, there's a piece in, a couple of pieces in the show that are in pencil on blackboard. And what I loved about it was that I, you know, I've worked with pen and ink for a very long time, and I love that sheen, I love that quality of the material. But graphite pencil is very, it's, it's as rudimentary as you get. And, and I thought, how can I push this material further? And so for me, that was the access to really try a new series. And I did that, you know, the portrait of me, um, 
I guess it's like it just means the profile shot of the, the graphite. And um, it's like the quality of that line changed when I worked on the graphite. That I there was a detail and there was like a I don't even know how to describe it. Versimeter? I cannot say that word. Vers Persimmon. He said it. <laughs> <laughs> That's He's saying it well, not. But that quality right. came out that I could not get. That kind of detail, exactly that piece. I yeah. couldn't get that detail with the white charcoal, not even if I tried. Yeah, okay. interesting. Oh. But the, the, the skin, the, the texture of the skin, it's really interesting in the way that it also looks like, like hair, like locks of hair. Mm -hmm. Or I think, I always used to think of muscle seed, mm -hmm. like mu muscle. Yeah, a lot but then, of people But some of it looked like, like, like waves of. You know what it is, honestly? Like, it's me failing a bigger drawing assignment when I was like 19. And you know how they do the measuring components, right? And it's very rigid. Right. And I being, I don't know, I smoked a lot of weed back then. I just really wanted to get very organic and, you know, really push the, the, the perversity of the lines. You know, I was more interested in that flow and not so much. I mean, I knew the measurement. I knew what I was looking at. But I, I just thought that it would be much more interesting if I'm going to break the body and I'm going to break up the face into panels, into landscape, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. How do I go about that with gradation, with marks, with the striated terrain? And I can't really give a, a word. You know, it's not hair. It's not muscle. I mean, yeah, but it's not. Yeah, but I always but feel nervous like, about saying that because I think a lot of people directly say it's definitely yeah. sinewy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it has that quality, but. I, I just think it's like, I, I akin it to handwriting. It's my way of, of writing. You know? Well, and also, I think something you said earlier was um, just landscape and land, like this idea of, the, of it creating a landscape out of skin versus and that thing versus the Right, and that's why I like to work in representational work or portraiture mm -hmm. because I didn't see that land mm -hmm. in the history of portraiture. Mm -hmm. This is a place to roam for people. When you see, and it's not just about, again, the visibility is not the only thing, but it's this idea of like the possibilities of that land. If you see something and then you go from that into something else, it, it just gives, there's like more avenues that we can branch out into. Mm -hmm. It's not simply about this is a black subject. Mm -hmm. This is more than a black subject. It's like what can a black subject be, you know? as a thing, you know, not so much as like indicative of a social political mm -hmm. thing, but literally like this is something on a picture plane that is, you know, usually in the background or holding up an umbrella. And how like how do you make it the center? And then from that center, let's break it up into, I don't know, an abstract language. And from there it becomes this whole new narrative and you form narratives upon narratives upon narratives. And then the the fictive becomes much more liberating mm -hmm. and less oppressive. So that's really what I'm interested in. Well, I think also your work is so much of it is about, like when I look at it, I almost, I don't see sometimes even, you know, it's like contour and it's like topographical and it's like light and shadow as opposed to being this person, that person, this face, that face, exactly. you know, it, it is abstracted to bring it back to that, <laughs> come on to the thing. Um, well, I don't know, Joanna, if we are doing a Q&A session of this evening. Is there any interest in a Q&A session of this evening? Yeah. yeah yes? Yeah. You who work at the gallery have questions? <laughs> okay. Yes, I would love to hear your questions. You're first. Um, I guess my question is about progress from one show to the next. One thing that you both have is you're youth, but you're also both very accomplished. And my yep. curious, my question is sort of, how do you leave room for growth from one show to the next? And then also sort of allowing, not just like for Tony or for, or for Odile that you have, you know, room for shape or material or color that is introduced, but rather also kind of playing in this conversation is new ideas. Do you leave room for that growth or is it, you know, as, as, as our society changes, new things get introduced or so forth. How does that process work from one exhibition to the next one? Okay, I'll take a question. Well, I, I think the only reason, I, I mean, with each show that I've done, I mean, I'm just seeing sort of like a survey of what I've been doing. I mean, I, I had a very unfortunate incident in graduate school where an advisor told me, and I think he was just, you know, a hater. 
but he um, he said that you know well I just got represented by Jack and he was like you're basically gonna make the same work for the next five years and uh, I was like oh well well <laughs> you shall see and I, I so I forced myself to push every show I would do I wanted to because I just needed to for me to explore another idea another theme another uh, aesthetic <laughs> uh, in each show and. Um, now I'm much more interested in revisiting some things that I rushed through, I feel, in the past. And so it's very cyclical now for me um, because the marks are never ending. I, I feel like there's a world in there and the materials are always going to be there. And there's going to be new materials and new surfaces to work on. Um, so I, I, ideas come from that for me more than anything. Same thing. I mean, it's just you want to challenge yourself. That's a very mean spirited thing that person said. I mean, but yeah, you know, for real? But um, yeah. And he went to Yale and I was all like, oh, okay, boo. Okay. Cute for you. It's crazy. You're just a nice person. person. You but, know what? I mean, but it's like, you know, it's like, chill out. Yeah. It's yeah. an unnecessary statement. Yeah. Right. But no, it's definitely, you just want to challenge yourself. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, you want to you wanna, you wanna learn more in the process. I mean, that's what it is. F failing, I tell my students, mm -hmm. failing. Is, is, is actually, um, there's a great benefit to failing because you actually, in failure, you actually see yourself more clearly. Mm -hmm. You see, because you, you, you see your limits in as much as you see what, what you produce. So you can, you can learn a lot in failing. And you can't be afraid to fail. I mean, it's just a matter of that. And I think that's the problem sometimes with being an artist in, in the, an overly market-driven art world. You, you, you tend to want to repeat your, I mean, this making the same stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's like you know, you just um, you want to try to uh, go beyond beyond that that initial fear, that self preservation, and just uh, try to learn something more. It's going to be better for you and for other people who engage the work. Um, I, I'm going to have just moderator prerogative and ask you a really quick follow up question. Um, where do you teach, um, and how does? I, it seems like teaching is, is a big part of your practice, and that you do. There is an exchange that you have with your students, which I think is a really an amazing thing. But I'm curious about where you teach, and how long, and where else you've taught. Yeah, yeah. I've um, I teach at the Tyler School of Art at Temple University, but um, we were talking earlier also about like I used to I, I uh, was I started writing mm. and curating yes. when I became an artist in New York because it was a means of were curating because it was a means of just getting my work and work with my friends out into the public. Mm -hmm. And then writing came just after that. And what I learned in the writing was that my mind was like a mess, just totally disorganized. <laughs> and it taught me how to just organize my thinking mm -hmm. to write and to just organize my thoughts and, and just my imperative, like what do I want to do? And so like that that was that was that there. And then my method of teaching comes out a lot about like, you know, what kind of teacher would I have liked mm -hmm. if I was, when I Not was Not one student. who would have said that. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> you know, just, but and you know, more. Yeah. yeah, so just doing that and, and then just realizing that I learned a lot about being an artist, writing about other artists and visiting their studios and learning about possibility by so many art artists doing so many different things and making so many different things, interviewing, interviewing artists, mm -hmm. learning about them. And then now, with just working with students, it's just like, you know, they're younger, you can see their ambition, and that kind of makes you alert, you know, you just make people want to make things. But mm -hmm. just being, I realized, being a better teacher means that I have to be a better artist, and that was part of the process of me, just growing and expanding in my own practice. Just if I'm gonna teach better, I have to be a better artist. It's kind of an amazing thing that you've said, but I love that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, do we have other questions? I saw we'll go one and two and three. So, yes. Um, so when I look at both work, and when I was here to see your work in person, Toy, and I thought of like the performance of the art making. You know, I thought of people who do um, um, process-based work. Um, the process of putting the mark down, I thought of um, you know, in early childhood, when children draw, they don't draw a literal representation, they draw the movement. You know, I jumped up and down in the park, and I ran around the marriage around. And that's kind of how they tell their story. And so to me, when I look at actually both artists, as a good parent, clearly they thought about it. Um, <laughs> um, there's a process of 
making a mark that becomes like a dance on the surface of the material um, that tells a different story. Because you think about, or at least I do, because like you stare at the work for a long time, you think about that moment where you're placing the mark maker on the surface and how that moves from one space to the other to create this larger composition. So I'm, I just I just want to kind of think about, ask about, like, is that something, do you think about the <coughs> movement that goes into the narrative mm -hmm. of the piece? Yeah, like I, I mentioned the puzzle before, mm -hmm. and I, I could, like I said, every time I approach any drawing, I mean, the, the piece, uh, the two diptychs, when you first walk into the show, um, that's kind of a beautiful example of how my mind is thinking because I see the the second one that's fully covered in my head, um, but it always starts with that sketch mode. And for me, um, the demarcating is like the, the starting of piecing together the puzzle. But rhythm is key because if it doesn't have a rhythm that look, I mean, I, I mean, look, you can do that. And I don't know, I guess on this thing it looks like, oh, it just looks like you put it together. But it's, it's really like saying, okay, this move, you know, these marks are going to go this way, and then this mark is going to go that way, and this mark is going to go down. And I, I plan that in my head, or as I'm going, because sometimes you have to change the rhythm of it. And I have done drawings where I did the same exact, everything was spaced, and it's the most boring looking thing you can imagine. And it really is about how do you play with that, and. It's a lot about movement. It's a lot about um, rhythm, really, I find. Um, and I, I think I mentioned this yesterday, like music really helps. You put on some Marvin Gaye, <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. It, you can literally create, it's, it's something, I don't know. It, 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 I like that, I like creating rhythms in it. Because I see people follow it mm -hmm. when they look at it. Because I do that. So it's like, what the beauty of this is that you're seeing what I'm seeing when I'm working on it. Okay. Um, no, Julie, do you want to speak to that? Uh, no, I mean, I didn't feel it was. OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we're yeah. looking at a question. The next one that I said, yes, there you go. So I'd like to, Torian, you said something that I'd like you both to um, sort of expand on. And I'll probably be stoned for asking you this. But you, you alluded to the culture of the gallery and people feeling good about coming in and seeing your art and you, and you said bring your friends. Mm -hmm. And as someone who's an outsider here, we're from Durham, North Carolina, we're with the Nasher. The attitude that you find in New York when you go into galleries is not very welcoming. <laughs> and, and so <laughs> what do you do? We're definitely laughing because we know it's true. <laughs> 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 Do you talk to the gallery owners about that, the culture that you want created in the gallery? So when people come in, they feel excited and welcomed, and it's like going to the Nasher. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't there be a cross section? 
you know, and not just with, you know, visual art. I mean, let's, it's fine to have diversity of thought within a room. I don't understand why this is so dangerous. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like so scary to even imagine. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm being really, like, you know, naive and like, to, you know, oh, let's all come in, you know? But I, I do feel like there are conversations that happen. Some of it can be a bit, you know, off-putting to people, but hey, it happened. It makes you think about it later. That's only, that's all a good thing. Uh, I also think that there's like kind of an aura in, in like say, when I was coming, I was walking from, um, Penn Station, and then I went to Fifth Avenue and 23rd, 28th Street, dropped to pick up something there. Then I walked across 26th Street from Fifth Avenue all the way to 10th Avenue. And then um, I walked past these huge limo SUVs, you know? And they're just sitting there, and guys are sitting, they're just like lined up. And the people are sitting, and then the cars are just running. I'm realizing those are people's um, rides back home. The people, there's somebody who was in those cars, just like they're running around this neighborhood, you know, shopping maybe, or just you know, shopping for art, or looking at art, or just spending time. And then those cars, those vehicles, are waiting for the people to come back, to drive them wherever. And so, like, there's this. This is a different kind. This is this arena is not the 26th Street between Sixth, Seventh, or Sixth and Eighth Street, which is like buy any kind of hat or mm -hmm. any kind of, you know, stores of just only hats or stores of only fur coats or whatnot. This is a different marketplace. And this marketplace is like a really like uh, glamorous, high-end, super chic one. And I guess that's part of the, 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 the fantasy or the illusion or, or the reality of, of why this place is like that. I was thinking exactly the same thing. I was thinking, you know, my, my wife is always complaining about walking around here. People are rude <laughs> to her in these places. And I'm just like, they're not rude. I know the person there. They're, they're just busy, you know? But it's like, it's a different kind of, re it's not McDonald's and White Castles in Chelsea. But, you know, I think it is on, and I mean, I think I, I really love that question because I think it's something that it is on us who are in this world to think about because it's not gonna be different if we're like, oh, but we're just, we're busy. You know, everyone's busy. Like, and if somebody took time out of their life to come and to, to a gallery and see artwork, like this in of itself is an amazing thing to me. If somebody comes to a museum to see artwork, that's an amazing thing in of itself to me. And so I do think some of the, most of the onus actually is on us, whether we are, whatever part of the kind of ecosystem that we occupy, um, and I do think, you know, there is, there's a culture to going to the hat shops, there's a culture to going to galleries, there's a culture to going to whatever kind of niche little industry, which is essentially what the art world is, it's a niche industry. You point out the fact that you visit, you have visitors here, because like if I go and yeah. visit Visa Corp, or if I visit, you, you know, can't you can't go there. Well, first of all, they're like, who are you, or whatever, but it's like, yeah. I'm not gonna be, I'm, the place is not set up to have a, 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 an arena of visitation, a, a, a system of visitation. Yeah. It's a different kind of situation. Yeah. So if you have visitors, right, you they're coming into your space, you might want to, I mean, well, using the logic, you, you might want to <laughs> welcome them. Basic hospitality. <laughs> so, so, yes, we'll all work on that. Just to add one more thing, I think it's also about this idea of like <laughs> private and public too. I think a lot of people who come into galleries especially, because I don't know if museums just a different type of conversation even of itself. I mean, there is prestige, obviously, to museums, but I think people feel like when they walk into galleries, they have to dress a certain way, they have to be a certain type so of person. There's a culture and, and there's codes. Right, you, and like I think things, that, Codes which you don't know, which right, you, codes I, you don't know are codes that make you uncomfortable. Right, but I also feel like people shouldn't come into a gallery space and feel like it's a privatized space. It's still public to an extent. I mean, it's, it's free. <laughs> it's, yeah. No shade on museums, but you gotta pay. <laughs> but like, you know, you can come into any gallery. You're just a donation, <laughs> I'm just saying you can walk into any gallery and no one in demands. Yeah. Don't but I think that's that's information and that's part of the code. People right. don't necessarily realize that. But actually the best place to see art in New York, the most art for the least amount of money, is Chelsea. Yeah. You know, and I think that, that it's a it's a problem of perception and a problem of of knowing those codes and having those codes be 
revealed rather than kind of awkwardly, sometimes probably not purposely, but it feels purposely hidden. It's always like you have, oh, you don't know. It's like a secret. Yeah, you're supposed to you know. You must be new here. Yes. <laughs> yes, so as I said, that's on us because that's rude. You know, our nobody's mother raised them that way. So we had another question, yes. Sorry. I have a question. Um, I know that both of you are Nigerian, and I was wondering if you ever show in Nigeria, like if you plan to, but also like what is the feedback that you get from other Nigerians in regards to your work? <laughs> and I'm also Nigerian. So <laughs> <laughs> I think this is like me wondering. <laughs> Have you ever showed your fellow Nigerians? <laughs> no. no. My no. friend, no. No, I tell me your story. No, I haven't. Now, wow. <laughs> well, no, I haven't. But it's it's um and, and I I I've I've, I've 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 taught there and I've done some stuff there, but um I I I and that's changing. But but I was always like you know what I I've been asked to show to show work there and so forth in different situations like. Let do it help local artists show. I mean, for me, it's like I want to. I want an artist. I want you to show the artists that are there first before I ever go there and do anything. I'm not really interested in, in, in this dialogue because it's like it's always looking outside versus looking in and, and, and working with what resources you have. The, the situation there is changing though all the time. I mean, there's, it's like you think that nothing's happening, then you turn around with Nigeria and places like Nigeria, but Nigeria, all of a sudden, they're like, they have 20 times what you thought they didn't have anything at all. So there's like, and, they and the language, they're using, they're using this art language speak about installation and so forth, like, and it still looks like the same kind of work, but their language is so sophisticated, it's like, wow. My work dynamic. is about these streets. <laughs> what happens on these streets? You know, sometimes, sometimes it's, it's over the here, and sometimes it's over there. But the streets is the core. It's the strength. Yeah. It's the strength. No, I um, I have to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Um, you know what's funny is that I uh, I the, the people. <laughs> my work who are of Nigerian descent are uh, people who live in London, New York, who have traveled from Nigeria, first generation, um, you know, migrants, people like me, um, who had that culture, that were, grew up in that culture, were embedded in that culture, but still have that outsider view. And I guess my work appeals to that more. Um, Whenever I go back, they always talk about my tattoos and my septum ring. It's just like the first thing. It's like I can't even have a conversation. Are you going to marry? You look so strange. Um, and that's from family members. It's like, it's like strangers on the street. Um, so uh, my, my, the thing, I did do that show at the Manil Collection um, in Houston with like Emeka yeah, cool. and the Promise cool. of Love show. And that was a really great show because that was a dialogue with mm -hmm. uh, you know artists outside of mm -hmm. Africa, the continent, and you know, and it was a really great dialogue. Right. And I feel like more shows like that are I'm looking forward to that because I think the outsider looking thing is a problem. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the sh why not have both? I mean, they did that because I think it traveled to Lagos, mm -hmm. right? Because it was in yeah. Philly and then it was in Houston. Mm -hmm. So that's a great example of where we can move forward with that. I think when we, we were both talking about how when you hear, oh, Nija, the sudden thing that comes to mind is like a very, very specific idea of what we, the best of ourselves. Um, and uh, the beauty of art is that you can show everything. And uh, I think some people want to keep wanting to show the best and don't realize that failure is a part of what Nija is. And, uh, and that sort of narrative is important too. And it doesn't have to be super shiny and clean and ready-made. It can be something very much a part of what's happening there. And it's dirty, and it's real, and it's not fully westernized. And there's a beauty to that. And it's, and it's, it's real. And it's its own thing. Exactly. It doesn't have to It's valid. It's, it's, a, it's a point, person, and it's yeah. a perspective that needs to be shown as well. So you know, if anybody has, wants to invite Toyin to be No, here, it's OK. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
That was one more question. No, it is okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. We'll do one more. So yes, yes we'll, we'll do one more. First per question for you. You said you arrived here when you were nine years old. Um, well, doing what? How old were you? Um, were you <coughs> six, six, in Nigeria? No, uh, it was six months old. There was a the, um, six months old. There was the the African War in uh, Nigeria, oh. and my family like um, fled in time. <laughs> they left in time. Well, that was very short, so. <laughs>